Thank you, Amola, and welcome everyone to today's webinar. <clears throat> our topic is culturally responsive education, diversity in our classroom. We have joining us today Dr. Penelope Latimer and Dr. Sa Sandra Tomlinson Clark, both from Rutgers University. We have an exciting presentation for you. Before we get going on the topic of the presentation today, I would like to find out from all of you who's joining us today uh, and the roles that you serve in. We'll see a poll box come up on your screen in just a moment, and I'd like you to select the response that best fits. Glad to see so many of you taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us today. Lots of researchers and higher ed folks in the audience today. I think that there's something for everyone in today's presentation, um, some pra more practical application for teachers and a lot of great background knowledge for our researchers and our higher ed folks. So at this time, I'm going to remove the poll and get us moving right along. As I mentioned, one of our featured presenters today is Dr. Sandra Tomlinson Clark. She's an associate professor in the Graduate School of Education at Rutgers University. She's also a licensed psychologist. And her research focuses on the factors that contribute to the personal development and academic achievement of diverse learners in middle school through post-secondary education. She also researches counseling training models and strategies that increase cultural competencies to assist professionals, like teachers, in providing culturally responsive services to their students. Dr. Tomlinson Clark has published papers on culturally responsive behavior management and on integrating technology into multicultural learning. Her colleague, Dr. Penelope Latimer, is also joining us today. Dr. Latimer is the former Assistant New Jersey State Commissioner of Education, and she has served as an Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction in a large urban district. She has served as a high school principal and a teacher as well. Dr. Latimer joined the Rutgers Institute for Improving Student Achievement, RISA, team as the Assistant Director in 2007, and she was named the Director in 2011. Dr. Latimer is involved in the development of RISA's work, specifically addressing middle-level education as well as arts integration. She also seeks to build networks and partnerships among districts with similar needs and interests in the central region of New Jersey. At this time, I'd like to welcome our presenters, Sandra and Penelope. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, this webinar is designed to explore and discuss issues related to developing culturally responsive classrooms. Culturally responsive teachers help to ensure that teaching and learning are relevant to their students, thereby increasing the likelihood that students are motivated and engaged in their learning. I will go over a few of our goals and outcomes for today that are listed here. Uh, we hope to provide an overview of diversity in the United States. We will discuss achievement and opportunity gaps and their relationship to diversity. We will discuss the research supporting culturally responsive teaching. We will present a framework for culturally responsive teaching and provide resources for teachers and school leaders to help implement culturally responsive teaching. As we discuss culture today, we are referring to the beliefs, the attitudes, traditions, values, and customs that are part of our daily lives. Everyone has culture. It's important to also remember that there are no culturally neutral classrooms. Culture is what guides 
professional practice in the classroom. Uh, and back to a, so first we would do an overview of diversity in the United States. Back to Elizabeth um, for this open-ended question. So before we get started in learning about diversity in our country, we're going to ask our participants to respond to this open-ended question. Uh, actually, two questions will come up. And we're interested in finding out from all of you what proportion of students and estimate of those that you work with come from diverse backgrounds? And also, what are your perceptions of students from culturally diverse backgrounds? So if you are working in a school setting, you can make an estimate here. If you're not, you might want to apply this to a school district that you're most familiar with. Seeing some pretty high percentages there for many folks. A lot of diversity in our schools and our classrooms. While we're giving folks a minute to continue to respond to the questions, um, Penelope and Sandra, we're not able to hear you quite as well as we would like to, the participants. So if you could either get a little closer to the phone or um, maybe try to adjust your volume slightly, I think that that would help our participants out. So a lot of interesting perceptions here. Um, <clears throat> Penelope and Sandra, do you have any thoughts on what you see there, folks' responses? Well, I think that um, <clears throat> what we're, we are seeing is uh, people are experiencing um, the challenges of cultural diversity, um, but uh, it's very it's very pleasant to see that many people are saying that the diversity enriches their classrooms and the learning experiences. And that's supporting the, the research that we're going to uh, be addressing. Um, so uh, it, it, this was scrolling pretty quickly, so I'm, I'm just picking up two kind of recurring uh, thoughts. Yeah, that was exactly what I was noticing too and I like the positive angle on it and I think that that's really in the vein of our presentation today is finding the positive with diversity and in, in helping educators figure out how to make it work well in their classrooms. So with that I think that we'll move right along and get started with the presentation. It was predicted uh, before the 2000s that uh, the United States would become one-third of the nation 
um, racial ethnic minority groups. You can see the pie chart here and notice that uh, that, in fact, has happened. The 2010 census reported that 37.7% of the nation identifies as a member of a racial ethnic minority group. Latino Hispanics identified as 17.1% of the population, followed by African Americans. Exploring your perceptions of students, racial ethnic minority students, helps you to gain a better understanding of some of the issues that may be affecting your classroom and the ability to effectively teach students. What's also interesting about the increasing diversity in the nation is that four states have identified as majority minority states. It's not surprising, they are California, Hawaii, New Mexico and Texas, and the District of Columbia. By majority minority, we are finding that the majority of people living there are members of racial ethnic minority groups. We're also finding that the numbers of students that have been identified as at risk are African American students and Latino students. And we're finding that the achievement gaps have examined academic performance between African American and white students and Latino and white students who are attending um, public school settings. And this remains a critical issue of concern. Based on reports from the U.S. Census Bureau, Hispanic and Asians have the highest rate of growth when compared to African Americans and whites. Although an increasing number of students live in households where, where English is not the first language spoken, they enter school with limited language proficiency in English. Hernandez Sheets uses the term heritage language rather than minority language, because by saying minority language, it's not reaffirming to those who do not speak English. So I think that's another term that we'll start to see more now in the literature, and that's heritage language. And Sandra, um, it's, it's important for all of us to, to remind ourselves that the increasing language diversity goes beyond um, the Spanish language and diversity with, uh, within that, that at least here in the state of New Jersey, the new challenges are the diversity within the Asian languages, um, Farsi, Hmong, and then um, the, the African uh, dialects that are coming uh, into our schools from various countries in the continent of Africa. Schools reflect and mirror society. Each year, American classrooms are becoming more culturally diverse. In 2002, Hispanic, Black, Asian, and American Indian students made up approximately 40% of the public school enroll enrollees. In 2011, that proportion had increased to 48%. In addition to race and ethnicity, Diversity in the student population includes culture, gender, language, sexual orientation, class, social economic status, and ability. Children entering school with limited English language proficiency often experience barriers to educational achievement. And students of color are less likely to be academically successful due to multiple barriers to educational attainment. In 63 of the 100 largest U.S. school districts, over half of the student population identifies students of color. I'd like to give a brief overview of achievement and opportunity gaps and diversity.
despite educational reform, one third of the nation's students entering high school did not graduate. Trends over a four year period under No Child Left Behind evidence that one third of the nation's schools, that's 33%, and more than one third of the nation's school districts at 36% did not make adequate yearly progress in raising student achievement. It's very clear that it's important to clarify the relationship between culture and learning. Measures of school success have tended to reflect cognitive and behavioral measures, effective dimensions of learning, how students feel about school, how students connect to what they're learning, and non-tested domains do not tend to be included as measures or outcomes of academic success. Native American, Alaska Native, Black, and Hispanic students, and students with limited English proficiency, and students with disabilities have graduation rates below the national average. White and Asian students have graduation rates above the national average. This chart um, depicts the graduation rates in the United States between 2011 and 2012 for high school. And you can see the difference and the national average at 80%. The disparities in academic performance are examined between student groupings, and that would be African American, black students, and white students. Latino, Hispanic students, and white students, low-income students, and higher-income students, boys and girls. And the comparisons have been uh, related to issues of English language proficiency, learning abilities, and nationality. An increasing number of students have been identified at risk and the achievement gaps between African American and white students and Latino and white students attending pre-K through 12 schools continue to be a concern. Although students were required to meet national, to meet, excuse me, state determined proficiency levels by 2014, many urban schools with diverse student groupings have not achieved adequately yearly progress. Disparities between student groupings are based on grade point average, standardized test scores, dropout rates, course selection, and when we say course selection, particularly students who are in the AP and honors classes, graduation rates, and college admission rates. And this is an area uh, where we think the role of the school counselor becomes so important to enter into the, um, the courageous conversations with teachers and with um, other, with administrators to disaggregate your data and to see who's, who is really participating in the, um, in the course selections um, at every grade level. Uh, in, in, your, in your school, in your school district. Uh, but with particular attention, when we link the opportunity gaps with the achievement gaps, we have to take a look at who's having the opportunities in what courses and, and how well is it going uh, in terms of data analysis of student achievement while they are enrolled. Um, examining gaps in learning opportunities, there are multiple inequities affecting the achievement gap. Some of the gaps um, result with teacher quality gap, school funding gap, digital divide gap, teacher training gap, 
income gap, affordable housing gap, health care gap. Extensive educational research in the United States has demonstrated that students, family, and community characteristics powerfully influence school performance. Children whose parents read to them at home, whose health is good, and can attend school regularly, who do not live in fear of crime and violence, who enjoy stable housing, and continuously attend school, whose parents regular employment creates security, who are exposed to museums, libraries, music, and art lessons, who travel outside their immediate neighborhoods, and who are surrounded by adults who model high educational achievement and attainment will, on average, achieve at higher levels than children without these educationally relevant advantages. Boykin and Nogueira's 2011 book details many of the gaps in achievement and opportunity to learn. The, um, in the value added um, learning experience um, that was referenced on the previous slide, we are here talking about um, opening up the types of experiences where students receive um, mentors, where there are small learning communities in which they are engaged uh, so that um, the efforts of learners can be noticed more quickly. Um, someone has mentioned uh, the, uh, the importance of, of daily attendance, regular attendance. That certainly is a prime indicator uh, of success. O'Donnell listed a number of problems that might arise in a culturally insensitive classroom. Students may have the abilities but are una unable to engage in a curriculum that is not interesting to them. Some of the problems, as listed here, are low expectations, not only by teachers of their students, but of students themselves in terms of their level or ability for performance. Alienation and lack of motivation, students are not engaged. Teachers may tend to focus on subgroups. There's an, an inaccurate interpretation of behavior, exclusion of certain students, and that exclusion can happen in the classroom or it can happen in the sense that teachers may feel the need to send those students out of their classroom. Inappropriate judgments of students' abilities. Students living in low-income neighborhoods attending low-income urban schools are more likely to experience environmental, social, and psychological barriers that impede their academic achievement. Now, this is a, a good time for us to introduce the the concept of uh, the impact of poverty on achievement. And of course, poverty is beginning to get a lot more attention. And it is true that uh, resources and quality of life and um, the, the um, educational achievements and, uh, uh, of uh, parents, particularly it seems to be of the mother, um, particularly in single household families, all of these factors um, play a role in the expectations. Um, and so much research has been done um, on the, the impact of expectations on a student achievement. Expectations of the uh, school itself, um, the, the historical um, remembrances of parents of expectations that were afforded them when they were students and now they're entrusting their youngsters to us again. And so um, my suggestion is that when we as educators make an effort to ensure that the, um, the clubs and the, the special events uh, of the schools are inclusive of all levels of students so that students then can see models before them, 
that their economic status is not um, a deterrent to their inclusion in the full realm of the, uh, of the academic diet and the, the social opportunities, um, then the research shows that there's a greater um, participation, um, more um, longevity of students staying with um, opportunities in school, such as the, the band, the school play, um, debating clubs, uh, when they can see a diversity of levels of participation and that there aren't just certain zones that are relegated for um, the better endowed individuals. I noticed someone asked a question about an example of an accurate interpretation of behavior. I think one of the biggest ones is because a student is not engaged, that they're not interested, and they don't have the ability. It could be that they're not engaged because they're not interested or they don't see the relevance of what's being presented in class to their life. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'll give you an example from, from my experience as a high school principal and as a teacher of world languages. If I had to actively recruit students into taking um, the French language um, when it was a predominantly black um, school high school and urban setting. And so the concept, uh, I peeled the onion, why aren't you um, registering for the French language? And I was a teacher of French, and I was also a teaching principal. And the students had the, the, um, the mistake in, the, the misunderstanding that um, the French language was only spoken in European countries. So I rolled down the map and I said, let's take a look at where people are speaking French as a first language. And then the discussion about career paths. Where might it be an enhancement for you to be able to, um, to advance yourself as an adult if you were able to perform duties in more than one language? It worked like magic to, for, for these youngsters. And so I, I'm giving you that example to say that we as educators have to be the futurists and, and help students to debunk their own misunderstandings uh, and set, that are setting low expectations for themselves and putting limits on their potential. Back to Elizabeth for an open-ended question. Great. I think that that was a very helpful introduction to today's topic. Um, as I saw in some of the comments in the parking lot, some folks seem to already know that information and I think a lot of it is probably commonly understood by educators but I do think it was still very helpful to set the stage for the rest of today's discussion and really lay out some of the facts and the data that are out there so that we are all entering this next part of the conversation with that same understanding. So with that we're going to ask our participants a question uh, you see it on the screen. Why do you think there are some classes, schools, and districts that are making more progress with respect to diversity than others? And <clears throat> specifically thinking about achievement and opportunity gaps. And if you can share some examples of the work you're doing in your schools and districts, we would love to see those comments. I see a theme of both leadership and professional development. Sandra and Penelope, do you see any comments there that surprise you or so I think that 
it was very here. reaffirming. Um, people speaking about high expectations for all. Um, but yeah, this one is interesting. Um, the the one that um, that is a little um, perplexing to me is the funding. Um, <clears throat> I wonder really what that relates to. Um, question of how people are using their resources. Um, perhaps it is very affirming to see that professional development and leadership and data are, um, are three areas that um, are, are repeatedly coming up. I'm happy to see that arts education programs, yay, <laughs> because we're going to talk about that. conscious effort to, to, uh, by administrators to engage the students of diverse backgrounds. Right? I'll also mention that someone asked in the parking lot, and others may be interested as well, that the transcript of each of these questions and the responses that you all are providing will be available in the webinar download that you will get um, you'll receive an email after today, probably sometime in the next few days, with the link to today's webinar. So if you want the transcript of these responses, that's where you will find it. So we'll pull this poll away from the screen and we'll get moving into the next section. We will now focus on culturally responsive education, uh, a, a framework. Monica Brown wrote a very interesting article entitled, Educating All Students, Creating Culturally Responsive Teachers, Classrooms, and Schools. According to Monica Brown, student diversity is not the issue. Rather, the problem is focused on educators' responses to demographic changes in the public school student population. According to Brown, teachers and educators must try to develop a closer fit between students' home cultures and the culture of the school. Rather than focusing on ways to design culturally responsive classrooms that increase opportunities to learn, Educators have focused on achievement gaps, comparing black and Latino students with white students. This, according to Brown and to others, is a mistake. It doesn't help students to learn. A very powerful quote by Howard, we can't teach what we don't know. What educators must know, educators must know the subject matter, but they also must know the student populations that they teach. The days where teachers lived in the community with the students that they teach doesn't happen anymore. Often teachers may not know the students that they work with on a daily basis. We also must know our own culturally biased assumptions and beliefs that may the impacting student learning. And so um, I might add that uh, I used to be humored by teachers who would, would say to me, oh, I'm working so hard, Dr. Latimer, I'm working so hard, but the, the students um, aren't learning. Or I know I taught that content. And the difference between that remark of working hard and working effectively paints the big picture of the opportunity gap. Today, we must not only um, feel and believe that we are working hard, but the evidence of knowing that we're working effectively comes when um, I would suggest to our listeners, when, when we sit together and we look at student work, and as a community of learners, and I hope that, that many of our, our listeners 
are members of the professional learning community within their schools, within their districts. And the body of work there is to reach agreements about standards. What will we accept? What's non-negotiable within our schools, both in terms of the standards of discipline and the standards of subject matter? What, what will we require as authentic learning and authentic ass assessment? And how will we make agreements as professionals as to what we will be accepting? And of course, each level builds on the next. So by looking at student work, we'll have the opportunity to determine whether or not the, the standards at the earliest um, um, beginnings of students' experience with us or the earliest entry into your school system, your school, is, is serving the learner well. And when it's not, what interventions do we have, what talent do we have within our team of professionals to help to make the adjustments? The importance of culturally responsive education. Taylor and Quintana wrote a very powerful article in support of culturally responsive education. Culturally responsive education exposes all children to cross-cultural and multicultural knowledge. And these skills are important to be productive citizens in a global society. It assists students in challenging cultural, culturally biased assumptions that may interfere with daily interactions and relationship building. Some have called it teaching to and through diversity. Culturally responsive education also helps us to identify schools that may be failing to effectively educate large numbers of racial ethnic minority students. It also helps us to realize that focusing solely on achievement gaps among and between students does not help students to learn better. Culturally diverse characteristics such as race, ethnicity, gender, language, ability, must be taken into consideration in developing effective teaching practices. It's important to identify the characteristics of schools and districts that are associated with failure and also those that are associated with success. Dr. Lanson Billings writes about culturally relevant pedagogy, and that is where she began her career looking at teachers in schools that were successfully educating large numbers of African American students. And so um, professional um, exercises that we might engage in would be to talk some, not so much about um, what we are teaching, but who we are teaching. And, um, and I would advise that particularly when you're at middle, middle grade and above, it's quite appropriate to ask the learners in your class to talk about their learning style. They really can tell you, um, and particularly if we give them some options, some, some um, triggers to start the conversation. And I would advise that you, um, you do a little scattergram for yourself of what students say is, is their learning style. What are their interests? Um, what is it that they want to learn in a particular course or during a particular segment of the school year? And then do that exercise again a few months later and ask them again, what have they learned about themselves, their learning styles? This, this bridges into building a, um, a spirit of confidence among the learners, which will then help you to know how to sort students for um, cross-cultural exchange within the classroom, regardless of what happens to be the task of the day, um, because you can see the students who have the same learning style, you may want to shake it up 
and then have students who don't have the same learning style learn how to grapple with making those adjustments for themselves. Another area that Taylor and Quintana mentioned is the importance of examining practices in the classroom that tend towards assimilation and what they call cultural um, ethnocentrism. What are the sources of diversity? Are students affirmed in healthy racial, ethnic, and personal identities? What kind of curriculum is used? Are issues of power, privilege, and oppression addressed? What kinds of class materials and books are used? And does it show diverse hero heroines and heroes? They say it's important that you have a full spectrum of people represented in the curriculum. I noticed that there was a, a a parking lot question that raised the um, um, the point of whether or not learning styles have a cultural component to them. Uh, and I would say um, I think so, and that's something for us to notice. For instance, um, there may be, um, especially with new students to U.S. schools, um, a cultural tendency to be more quiet. I would venture to say that um, I would agree with, um, with those who might say that we um, African Americans tend to be more animated in the way in which um, we talk and, um, and, and that students in, and, and families in this um, uh, northeastern uh, region um, of the United States, particularly in this New Jersey, New York corridor, we are often accused uh, of um, speaking very quickly and with colorful language. So uh, yes, I think that there are some cultural elements to learning styles, but but. You know, th those are the things that I would also venture to say we could have fun with in the classroom. Have listed, and we've uh, mentioned this a little bit early in the presentation as well, but just as a reminder of the sources of cultural difference in the classroom. Rosa Hernandez Sheets talks about the invisible culture in the classroom, which can often be very subtle but that students can pick up on, and they often realize that they are not being represented in the learning, um, the curriculum and the learning that's taking place in the classroom. I will just um, simply interject, Sandra, that um, the people who are, are um, putting on the parking lot using images, particularly images of beauty, um, and um, indeed, uh, in the elementary schools, students do love to um, be read to and to use reading um, um, to support their understanding. I would suggest that that's something that should go all the way through the grades, this use of literature. I will confess that, again, as a, a high school principal, uh, whenever I was addressing the, uh, the student body or or clusters of students, I always started with a piece of literature. And I remember having a, um, a visitor to the school once who was from the community, and he said to me, I thought that the students would, would um, be so disengaged, and, and, and he said, but I was amazed at how much they enjoyed that you began um, the meeting by reading to them you know, and I don't even know what the reading was, but that was a habit that I used, um, and it was a, a habit that acculturated the entire school to a certain level of expectation. So yes, I promote literature, promote using visual images, it's all good. So a little bit about what the research says. 
Boykin and Nogueira mentioned high quality instruction that facilitates critical thinking and fosters knowledge transfer skills must precede measurable achievement. Academic success for students is more likely to be achieved when academic knowledge and skills are situated within the lived experiences and frames of reference of students. And that's a quote by uh, Geneva Gay. Dr. Gay also asserts that culturally responsive teaching has personal meaning to students, engages students, and is more easily and thoroughly learned. Dr. Lanson Billings asserts that culturally relevant pedagogy is central to the academic success of culturally diverse students. For the individual who talked about um, learners who, um, who speak with an uh, accent, um, they write well, but their, their speaking is still in development, I would suggest that you give them many more, more frequent but short uh, and in protected settings opportunities to do oral presentations. Um, Keep it short, keep it with people that they're starting to feel comfortable with, uh, but that's, that's important. Conversely, um, teachers who were hiring into U.S. schools who are highly proficient in their content area, but who may um, be difficult for um, North American learners to understand, need to have that same kind of opportunity to practice their oral delivery. So to look a little closer at culture and a contextual influence of culture on learning, we think about the dimensions of culture. We have explicit culture, which may be the habits, traditions, and customs, and then the implicit culture, which are the values, assumptions, and beliefs. The boxes we have, family, school, and community, are intentionally not connected in this slide. It's important to think about students come from their family and they have a culture. They bring certain beliefs and expectations into the classroom. The school is its own culture and the community may reflect the culture of the, of the student or it may not depending on where the student um, is attending school. Gay asserts that culture is at the heart of all that we do curriculum, instruction, administration, or performance assessments. Too often the home and school, I'm sorry, the home and community culture of the student is not included in the school. Values, standards, beliefs, assumptions, communication styles, and worldview influence what we think, how we learn, and what we teach. When the cultural context of the student is not considered, student engagement and achievement are affected. Boykin asserted that the cultural fabric of schooling is deeply ingrained and is of European and middle class origins. School culture may be incongruent with the cultural context of the student's home and community culture. I noticed that um, someone um, calls our attention to the work of Alfred Tatum, and um, yes, we give a big rah-rah. Uh, uh, he was one of the first people um, that got my attention a number of years ago. He's a dear friend of our, our good uh, retired colleague, doc, uh, Dr. Dorothy Strickland, and uh, their work on interjecting literacy um, in this whole discussion. Um, so I, I certainly recommend, yes, Alfred Tatum's work indeed at Columbia. In this slide, we have connected home, school, and community and the cultural context in which students live. And now we're getting at the heart of culturally responsive teaching. Gay defines it as using the cultural knowledge prior experiences, frames of reference, and performance experiences of ethnically diverse students to make learning encounters more relevant and effective for them. T 
teaching to and through students' strengths. In addition, building networks between home, school, and community promotes healthy academic, social, and emotional well-being for students and their families. And here's a good um, time to remember what we all say, and but where where are where is the evidence that we believe we believe what we're saying when we say you know that the um, the parents or the first teachers. So um, I find that um, I get strange looks when I suggest to school administrators, school counselors, teachers to engage the parents in setting the discipline codes and the standards for the school. I recommend this to you highly. It's a technique that I used for more than 25 years in, uh, in an urban school district that had multiple schools with multiple diversity. But when you um, bring together parent leaders for each of those schools and let those parents engage in um, the deliberations about um, how children should be treated when things are not going well, and then let the students know that their code of conduct in, includes information from parents and that parents will be participating in the review of this, I recommend it to you highly. And that is one, one foundational way to make sure that you have a home school community connection that's going to work for you. So the congruency between the student and school cultures has been referred to in the literature by various different names. They all have much in common. They emphasize the congruency between students and school cultures, and that's seen as a way to improve student achievement. These approaches focus on the way classrooms are structured, and the policies and practices in the schools. More recently, research has talked about inclusive teaching, because I think the idea here is everyone has a culture, and what we're trying to do is make sure that students are included in the curriculum and that the lessons are relevant and meaningful for them. Sandra, I noticed that on the parking lot, um, there's uh, Erica Darkin, I believe, who is um, advising us that she and colleagues have developed a website, uh, Developing Cultural Competency Among School, school Staff, that um, I applaud you, um, not even having seen the, the website, the mere fact that you were able to reach consensus and you have something that you um, are actually using. Um, I think that's terrific. And that's the kind of professional um, um, support that we need um, in order to ensure that this topic that we're talking about is really a, a topic of practice in schools and in school districts. So congratulations. Yeah. Okay, back to Elizabeth. Yes, there's some really rich discussion going on in the parking lot, and it's great to see you all sharing resources and having discussions about the topic. Um, I know that this is a really exciting presentation, and this engagement is so helpful. So <clears throat> for this next question, we're wondering a little bit about some of these connections and having you share some specific experiences you may have had or observed in creating connections to students' cultural context. So we're going to get uh, in just a little while talking about some applications to our instructional practice, but we're interested in hearing right now about your experiences with this um, in your school. While we wait for folks to respond to that question, 
think it might be helpful, Penelope and Sandra, if you wanted to respond to, um, we, have, we had a few questions that came in when folks registered for today's webinar, and there was sort of a theme around teacher education and preparation, and we've touched on that a little bit already, and I know it's going to continue to come back up, but maybe you could briefly <laughs> just tell us a little bit about some of your recommendations for how teacher education programs, since we do have many folks here from universities and teacher prep, uh, any recommendations for how to incorporate all of this wonderful information into the teacher preparation well, program that, that people are running? And so I'll, I'll take a stab at this first. Um, this is Penelope speaking, and um, of course I come to this from having um, more than 25 years um, with various levels in the public school system and then being in the State Department of Ed and now at Rutgers uh, doing professional development. And so I think that fundamentally we have to explicitly uh, include this topic in, uh, in the curriculum for aspiring educators. And then I think that, and the way that we include it is to first have people really uh, have to engage um, in uh, courageous conversations that chip away at the, the issues that we're presenting today, but where we now discuss them through coursework um, from a reference point of who am I? The, um, this has been a topic that has been avoided um, or individuals have been able to avoid taking a course that explicitly addressed um, cultural competency. Um, and teaching, um, culturally responsive teaching for, for decades. And that's why you have a number of people of color who say that they were overlooked, they were you know, undereducated um, because the strategies that we're talking about today weren't presented. The other is that I think it's a part of the, the learning process as you're preparing to enter the profession there, there needs to be some evidence that um, individuals do enter into communities and schools that have a diverse um, teaching and um, diverse student population for the purpose of observing how those communities function and hopefully are functioning well. Um, together in the exchange of teaching and learning. And the motivational factors, um, you know. Uh, the other is to structurally make sure that some of, of our learning explicitly talks to the value and the importance of using data to, um, to be curious about who the learner is. And that curiosity has to last throughout the decades that we are a professional. It's not something that you learn, you know, in year one, and then, you know, it's, it doesn't become a part of you and your ongoing practice. Um, the data analysis is, is to be curious about who is in what courses, how well do students do. Also a data analysis um, with regard to um, what we are using as tools to impart knowledge. How, how balanced, how diverse um, are um, the literary experiences? Are we introducing um, a diversity of learning styles and uh, tempos in the delivery of math and science? Uh, are we noticing who are in those courses and in the upper levels? What, what, what's the range of music that we're presenting in music education? What's the range of, of visual arts experience? It's the entire realm and, and most important, the curiosity of educators to be engaged with not only the what we're teaching but who we are teaching and, that, the, and 
keeping abreast of the demographic shifts that will occur um, in the communities where you are working. That, that's a very helpful um, description of your recommendations and your thoughts on that. Um, I think it ties nicely in as you were speaking. I was glancing through the responses to the poll, and I see a lot of um, emphasis on not only the teaching, but the learning. And that's really what you were describing, too, is that as educators, we can continue to learn from our communities, our students, and have that be a two-way street. And I think that that's what a lot of folks are sharing is through some of the activities that they do in their schools, they're really bringing that community in and asking for them to share who they are. And that's a, a great first step in understanding the culture where you work and live. Yeah, I see some very good examples of, uh, uh, coming through on how people describe their experiences in connecting. Um, a lot of folks talking about they have interview sheets. I love this one. Someone said that she plays, um, she makes Pandora music lists and I guess has students to vote on what types they like. Um, the, here again, this interviewing of students, um, uh, they, are, they are people, so they love to tell you about your, themselves if they feel that we authentically want to know. And we really slow ourselves down, take the time, and then we use that information in a very positive way. Um, Here's one person who says, when I fail to start the year with team building and bonding activities that are recognized, the year did not go well. Absolutely, yeah. Field trips, yeah. And that's another thing that um, someone sent a, a question in uh, earlier, Elizabeth, about um, how to prepare young, um, if you're going to be working in a needy environment. First of all, I, I really rested for a long time in my head and in my heart on even describing the environment where you're going as a needy environment. And yet I know what you're talking about. You know, I mean, some places are more beautiful than others. Um, and um, I will recall that um, as a assistant commissioner in this state of New Jersey, I was given a a series of difficult assignments and going into some difficult communities. But what I said to the, um, to the leaders in that community, I said, show me the beautiful places in this community. I want to know where they are. Where do the families go when they want to have an uplifting experience? What's, what's the park that, that's used? What's, you know, um, where are the, the beautiful neighborhoods? And uh, so I would suggest that if you're preparing to start a career and it's in a, a needy um, neighborhood, um, to use that language, be curious about what else is there. Um, I'm sure that there are some historical areas I'm sure that there are major churches and synagogues. Um, uh, and so um, be curious about which, where you're going and do some advance work so that you can make references to those things when you're meeting the, especially the parents of students who are going to be giving you the family gifts. This is great, and I see the comments keep coming in, and there's still a lot going on in the parking lot, um, folks sharing some different resources and reading material. Um, so let's keep that going over in the parking lot. We'll move off this poll for now, and we're going to move into some more talk about culturally responsive teaching and some ideas for how to do that well in your classroom. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, so culturally responsive and inclusive classrooms. 
culturally responsive classrooms specifically acknowledge the presence of culturally diverse students and the need for these students to find relevant connections among themselves and with the subject matter and the tasks teachers ask them to perform. And that's a definition, a clear definition, um, that Montgomery provides in one of her papers. Okay, so the question that many ask, but that's just good teaching. Well, Lansing Billings wrote an article that deals directly with that question. And she says, yes, it is good teaching, but it's more than that. It's a socio-political act. It's a humanizing pedagogy committed to collective empowerment. Culturally relevant pedagogy links students' experiences at home with what they experience in school inclusive of speech and language interactions. According to Lansing Billings, teachers use, develop and use a philosophical and ideological framework for their practice that is committed to and promotes equity in education. Students must experience success and readiness and preparedness for academic success. She talks about students engaging in academic leadership and developing cultural competence. And according to her, cultural competence for a student is appreciating and celebrating one's own culture and also acquiring knowledge and fluidity in another culture. We're moving in terms of culturally responsive teaching to what many have equated as social justice and social justice advocacy and equity in education. According to Nieto, um, culturally responsive teaching is a way of looking at the world. says that it's not just simply a program, a class, or a teacher. Sandra, I want to jump in here for just a second because we have a really poignant question related to this, uh, some of the bullets on this slide. Uh, Catherine is asking, how do we change the mindsets, especially of seasoned teachers? And I think it might be helpful here to talk a little bit about, you know, ideally this is what we would like to see in classrooms, but when we have folks who are resistant or who have a mindset that is not necessarily aligned with the tenets of culturally responsive teaching, how do we work with that? Um. So uh, I'll start, this is Penelope again, um, changing, uh, and I did see that uh, point from Catherine, um, changing the mindset of, um, of resistive teachers. Um, the, the first thing I, I would do is to um, have them engage in, um, in, conversa in conversation that takes them back to their purpose. Why did they enter the career path of education? What does that mean to them? And, and do they intend to be a teacher for all students or just for select students? Um, the, the other thing is that these certainly would, would be the most resistive uh, individuals um, need to be confronted with the understanding that if the learners aren't doing well, they are not doing well. The second, then, the specific strategy is that we must get these folks into um, some professional development where they are exposed um, not just to the eye of the storm, which is the data that shows that, it, that um, if we can't um, adjust ourselves as the educator, as the professional, to be inclusive of all learners and to meet the learner at their point of need, then we need to go to the big picture um, issues also, which is um, 
what what happens um, for our society when we continue to um, to advance um, youngsters who have not been well taught, and who owns that responsibility? So I think professional development, I think the use of data, um, and I think a demographic uh, studies that shows who who are the students in today's public schools, public school districts. Is that helpful? I think so. I, I just thought it would be helpful to talk about that right there while we were discussing it. So we can carry on with the slide now. Um, I would like to pick up, um, because um, Bill De La Cruz from Denver, I believe, has posted um, a number of really good comments that are very supportive of, um, so we might, at some of our listeners and, and people who are following this may want to connect with him and to get some of his resources from Denver, because he's, he's put some nice things here. Okay, so what cultural responsive teaching is not? We've talked a lot about what it is, so what is it not, okay? So it does not use or identify culture as the sole reason for school failure or classroom management problems. Sue and Sue, who are psychologists, caution that too often we identify the cultural difference as the problem. And that is not what culturally responsive teaching is. Okay? It's important for all students. And Culturally responsive teaching, again, could be thought of inclusive, as inclusive teaching. These are four factors that have been associated with teacher effectiveness. Organizational culture, socio-demographic composition of the school, teachers' interactions with their students, and goals for learning. Penelope and I will focus on the last two factors in discussing the importance of culturally responsive classrooms. Teachers' interactions with students and goals for learning are fundamental to culturally responsive teaching. Mm -hmm. So with regard to teachers' interactions with students, I think it's, it's very important that um, right through to the, the last day, um, before we say goodbye to that high school senior, um, the teacher's responsibility is to demonstrate that we have a sincere interest in their welfare, and um, and that interest in the welfare is codified in terms of their having some real marketable skills, a, a true preparation for for career or for college readiness. Um, and so, um, but alongside of that is the building of confidence within the learners who are in our care, in our classrooms, and their families. And so some specific ways that we can build that confidence is to show an interest in their work when they are not specifically in our classroom. Know who the students are, um, who are in various clubs and organizations in, in the school, and when that club and organization is having their special moment, be present as, as a teacher of those students. Take time to, in classes, congratulate learners for something that they've done other than pass a test in your class. Um, and extend that same um, congratulations to colleagues who are including students who you, sh who you share in, uh, in the teaching learning process in other activities. Um, so, so, Research shows that teachers who show interest in their students as individuals and as members of diverse communities will positively impact their students' learning. So from day one, as Penelope was mentioning, you want to let them know 
that you were eager to know them both academically and personally. You recognize who they are and how you interact with your students and how they interact with you affects how they learn. This is all about finding ways to engage students in their learning. Zet Jackson wrote a wonderful book entitled Pedagogy of Confidence. And she talks about what teachers who have students who are successful believe in. She talks about fearless expectation and support for all students. Based on the transformative belief that within all of us resides an untapped reservoir of potential to achieve at high success or high levels. Teachers who operate from a belief in the potential of their students will have students who achieve at higher rates. Here are some guidelines for culturally responsive teaching. Uh, the first one deals with self-assessment, and it provides a way for teachers to examine their knowledge base, explore culturally biased assumptions and beliefs that might interfere with teaching students. It's also a suggestion to use a broad range of instructional materials that capture the experience of the students in your class. Connect lessons around themes and interdisciplinary units, and use instructional scaffolding. Reflect students' culture in the class. Involve students equally in class activities. I noticed in the parking lot someone mentioned that at times it seems like some families or, student, or teachers may be more interested in the achievement of boys than girls. And again, it's important to recognize if this is a bias and to work towards achievement for all students. Engage students in active learning experiences, fostering creativity, inquiry, and discovery. And to use ongoing and systematic assessments of student abilities. Include both tested and non-tested domains and using a, whole, a holistic approach to student skills, abilities, and potentials. The important, here, the important thing here is to help students in discovering their strengths. This is an example of a professional development focused on arts integration that Penelope and I conducted last year with a district in New Jersey. And one, uh, a few of the teachers working together in a team came up with the idea of combining art, literacy, math, science as part of the Hispanic Heritage Month. So what you're looking um, at here are the, um, the outcome products, where a music educator works with a science teacher and a math teacher um, to, um, to integrate um, the visual arts and music into um, a science lesson. And so we're, we're suggesting with just this one model that arts integration um, is one way to demonstrate to learners that they can be recognized for their strengths. And then we can use the strengths to, um, to encourage students to, um, to, to be willing to go into um, the more difficult uh, content areas, because they, they will know that um, we're recognizing that they, they have um, valid knowledge that's transferable into more than one area. And by seeing their teachers um, behave that way, uh, 
the responses from the teachers, there are 21 of them who are, who are in this cohort uh, who are learning how to integrate the arts into the um, content areas of math and science. The teachers are telling us that one of the joys that's coming back to them is to hear their students um, talk about what it's like to see their teachers working together. And indeed, um, one a very charming uh, story that came back to us was how t uh, students vetted from one teacher to the other um, their understanding about um, a body of learning that both teachers were, were presenting. So it went something like, well, you know, Dr. Latimer said that you should do X, Y, and Z. Um, and they were presenting that to um, Dr. Tomlinson Clark. What do you think about that, Dr. Clark? Is that right? And so the teachers got um, felt that they were validated in their work together and that they, um, they also were seen very differently um, by their students. So it was a win-win situation. So this slide, again, is summarizing culturally responsive teaching. And again, in, in the importance of acknowledging the presence of culturally diverse students in the classroom and assisting students in finding connections among themselves and with the content area. So a culturally diverse knowledge base. Just a review of the areas to address in developing culturally, cultural awareness and knowledge. We've talked about ethnic groups, values, traditions, communication styles, and that's both formal and informal communication, learning styles, the contributions, which should be inclusive, and relational patterns. What are the relational patterns that students have with authorities, with adults, and with other children? So understanding these cultural views and practices can help to promote learning and development among students and teachers. So designing culturally responsive curriculum. Creating formal plans for instruction, teaching about race, power, and oppression, identifying strengths and weaknesses in the curriculum, and teaching students to engage in critical thinking skills, critical analysis. In terms of symbolic curriculum, what does the classroom look like? Who is represented on the walls and the pictures and the bulletin boards? What are the or overt messages? And does it reflect diversity? And then the societal curriculum deals with correcting, correcting inadequate knowledge and using teachable moments. I just want to acknowledge um, on the parking lot a comment by, I think it's Daniele Poling. I think this is this is marvelous, um, this dialogic teaching that you uh, mentioned here that's creating a forum for students to share feelings through argumentation. Um, and, and certainly that would be a strategy that works well at the middle grades and through high school. Um, and the more diverse the population, the more I have found students love to argue. Uh, and when, when you're teaching argumentation correctly, and then require that that be matched with um, some literary references, I think um, this is a terrific um, instructional uh, strategy. So congratulations. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. This is a, another work product that um, was presented as a result of the Arts Integrated Professional Development that Penelope and I conducted last year. And this is an example of combining art, math, and science. And students measured, which you have the eye, 
which um, brought in the art and the fractions component. They used pointillism to draw the picture there. And science, they learned directly about the eye. And on the right, well, my right, yeah, right looking at it, is the art teacher. And on the left is the math teacher. And so um, it, the reports back to us were that students really engaged, were engaged and enjoyed working on this project. And actually, it turned out to be a beautiful piece of art. So building a culturally caring learning community. The importance of caring, caring that translates into high level learning and success, caring as cooperative, holistic, and integrated, caring as a moral imperative, and moral imperatives have been directly connected with social justice advocacy, caring as a social responsibility, caring as educators who are partners in the success for all students. Using student cultures and experiences to increase motivation and academic achievement. Of course, I would just um, rush in to say that um, creating this culture of caring um, learning community begins with us. It begins with the, the educators, um, with the leaders in the district and in each school. And so these are not techniques to, um, to think about as transference to the learner. It begins in those professional learning community, courageous conversations, those um, uh, departmental meetings, those grade level meetings. We need to test out the, um, these concepts and engage ourselves in this work first, and then we see how we're going to be using this responsibly with, um, with the learners who are in our care. I noticed also in the parking lot there were questions or comments, I should say, about communication and communication styles. Communication styles reflect values and shape learning. The verbal messages, whether they're direct or indirect, uh, the nonverbal messages. There's been a good bit of work done on what's called high context versus low context cultures. High context cultures tend to be cultures where it's not just what's said, it's how it's said. So the nonverbals become very important in understanding the message. And low context cultures are cultures where you tend to just listen to the message and the nonverbals may not be as important. So in other words, someone may tell you that they care, but their nonverbal message is suggesting that maybe they don't. So the nonverbal becomes more important to the listener than just the words. Okay. There's topic-centered. Uh, discussion, and that's typically what you see in the classroom where you identify a point and you focus on that point. There's topic chaining communication, and that's more contextual, where a speaker may cover a number of different areas, and for the listener, they're wondering, where are you going with this? But then they connect it at the end. So in most classrooms, we don't use topic chaining communication, um, but students may be using that in their home environment. So it's important to realize that there is a point, and they're working their way around to it. <laughs> OK, Elizabeth, an open-ended question. Yes. Um, so much interaction is going on already, but we're going to give you another prompt to um, hear from you all about what components of culturally responsive teaching you may have seen implemented or implemented yourself. Um, so this is similar to a lot of the <clears throat> comments we're seeing as people sharing their experiences. But we'll pop this one up for a few minutes and let folks respond there.
Sandra and Penelope, I know while we're waiting for some responses there, a few folks had asked about maybe some measures of cultural responsiveness, some tools or resources that can be used to determine if culture, culturally responsive pedagogy is happening in schools. And I know you you have some general thoughts about that, and you you touched a little bit on it in reference to some things people are suggesting. But do you have any other um, thoughts on that question so we make sure folks hear from you on that? Well, one technique um, that I found to be very valuable um, was to do um, walkthroughs. Take a walk through your school, um, teachers looking at other people's um, evidence of student work on your bulletin boards, uh, what's on display in the hallways. Uh, what, if you were to enter your school, what would be the first impression? Uh, so I think um, frequent walkthroughs is very good. Another strategy that we're recommending in professional development, which is which is related to the walkthroughs, is to um, take a part of faculty meetings or uh, team meetings to, as a group, walk a corridor, stop and talk about how it felt to be in that corridor. What did you notice? What would you say was the work that's being done by students? And what did, would you say was the quality of the work? Is, um, you know, uh, this has... Um, made impact in places where I've used this because some people have seen where some things that were on display were not really what needed to be on display. And so it's, you know, it's again, it, it helps to organize your point of view as a community in terms of what's good, better, and best. So that's one thing I would recommend. The other is um, open-ended questions. Um, and that may, may be um, triggers for, um, you know, a, um, an icebreaker when you come together in team meetings or in a faculty meeting. Uh, you may want to uh, take something that's a hot issue in your community, um, or it may be something that's seasonal, for instance, you know, special holiday period, and talk about how that may be, um, what are your plans for representing that. Um, what, what may be the plans for a pinnacle moment of celebration of uh, academic success or special um, success within the school, how are we going to vet that to make sure that we have noticed that all of our communities who will be coming together on that particular evening, afternoon, will feel comfortable. Um, and then um, always I like um, reading. So excerpts of books or book studies itself, um, have you thought about um, the whole school reading a particular book um, in, in a school year, having a designated time where you get together to really have conversation about it? I, if you want to do that, I certainly would recommend some of these on our list and, um, and the Yvette Jackson book on a pedagogy of confidence. That's helpful. Um, building that common understanding is a <clears throat> wonderful start to those in a school community being on the same page, so to speak, with what the expectations and goals might be. And I think, <clears throat> as I don't want to spend too much time on this poll because we have a little bit more information to get through, but again, some really wonderful recommendations and examples here. and. Like I've already mentioned, and I know people want to capture this information, we will make the transcripts available. Um, we'll send out an email following today's webinar with that information. So if you haven't caught in everything, like we haven't either, it's moving pretty quick, um, we'll, we'll provide that to you after the webinar today. So right about the richness of what's happening in the uh, parking lot, uh, here again, um, Sandra and I just noticed a comment by Heidi Decker-Moray. I think this is terrific, where she likens um, the cultural differences. If you're Catholic, uh, 
you're non-Catholic and you go to a Catholic service and you're moved by it and you, you shout, Amen, <laughs> you know, um, that's, a, that's a very good uh, example of a cultural crossover and uh, it would probably be highly appreciated by the, uh, the priests, the, the choirs, <laughs> and the others. Being of Catholic origin myself, I feel comfortable saying that. <laughs> So, okay, so I think we're ready to move into the next section. Yes, culturally responsive classroom management. Um, expectations for appropriate behavior in the classroom are often culturally influenced. Effective communication in the classroom is a critical aspect to building culturally responsiveness in a learning community. Along with my colleagues, Professors Weinstein and Curran, we conceptualize the framework for culturally responsive classroom management, CRCM. Our goal was to create the conditions for positive classroom climates that encourage personal development and academic success for all students. In terms of thinking about this model, there are some things, though, that are non-negotiable, and that is the classroom environment must be safe and fair for all students. Behavioral expectations and academic expectations. The practices include creating a physical setting that supports academic and social goals, establishing and maintaining expectations for behavior, and working with families. Research on classrooms of teachers who implemented culturally relevant pedagogy showed that teachers maintain high behavioral and academic expectations. Classroom rules were clear and reinforced. Teachers, however, were also able to share power in the classroom, engaging students in creating important decisions and policies. Outcomes of culturally responsive teaching. Students are more likely to experience academic success, they are ready and prepared for success, and they are engaged in their academic learning and become potential leaders. They maintain cultural competence and they are able to develop critical thinking skills. Okay, so just here a summary of much of what we discussed today, that the diversity, diversity in the United States is increasing and minority students are being negatively affected by the achievement gap. Culturally responsive teaching is a tool for addressing the achievement gap by helping students to engage more fully in their learning. Culturally responsive teaching acknowledges student diversity and engages students in relevant and meaningful learning. Culturally responsive behavior management requires self-reflection, gaining knowledge of our students' backgrounds, and building caring classroom communities. Okay, Elizabeth will now talk about some of the key takeaways. Yes, we're actually going to ask participants to share with us your key takeaways from today's presentation, um, what you might have gleaned today and what you intend to do with that information. Um, we always like to hear how folks are taking it back to your settings and, and applying this to the work that you do. So you'll see <clears throat> this last question come up and you can type in your responses. And while we do that, I did see one question that just popped up related to the culturally responsive classroom management that you were just talking about, Sandra. And uh, the question was really, what, how is that different than 
traditional classroom management. Can you maybe provide an example or a little more information on that? I think that um, the issue with culturally responsive classroom management goes back to some of what we've discussed about culturally responsive teaching, that there are times when student behaviors are misinterpreted or misunderstood, that students who are viewed as different tend to be punished more often, um, disciplined more often, often. And culturally responsive management is not about discipline. It's more about creating culturally responsive and caring classroom environments that foster learning. So specifically, the difference might be that um, rather than assuming that you understand the reason why a student made a certain remark, um, acted sullen, refused to be engaged, um, to have the time out conversation, if you have the kind of classroom um, situation where you can take the student aside and do some probing um, before determining you know, what's, what's to be the, the discipline factor. Uh, so I, th I think that what we're, what we're attempting to express is that the, a successful environment where culturally um, relevant teaching and discipline is occurring is developing over time. And or if you're going to start with very explicit um, classroom rules as opposed to classroom values, then you need to take time at the top, the first day, the second day, the third day to continue to discuss what the standards of acceptable behavior will be, what's going to be non-negotiable, and get that understanding and have interaction with the learners about that, then move forward with the, with the delivery of, of teaching with high expectations for everyone's success. Thank you. I think that, that was a helpful response. And moving back over to our takeaways, um, I got stuck on one that just seemed to resonate with me. Amanda Matheson says that rather than seeking a program that delivers professional development, my focus will be on establishing a mindfulness of culturally responsive practices with my staff. And I think <clears throat> this relates to an earlier piece of our conversation around leadership. And I think that that is an excellent takeaway that we as educators should be the model for this in our work with other educators, with, in our work with families. And that then can translate down into our classrooms, transfer into our classrooms. Um, so I think that that's a helpful sort of big picture takeaway and goal. Did you notice any um, comments? You may not have had a chance to look closely through those yet, but are any um, really resonating with either of you? Well, things are scrolling rather quickly, so it's, I'm trying to um, grab a couple that um, I liked uh, the person, it goes back a, a bit, who talked about um, being old-fashioned, because I think I can <laughs> relate that too. And so the question was, something like a, a takeaway was that she was going to be self-reflected about her, her old-fashioned values and biases and really how to, to be authentically herself, but at the same time to integrate um, you know, some of the thoughts of this in exchange today. The other is that I would agree with the people who are saying that, um, you know, and, and I always love this, um, when, when um, educators um, recognize that we learn from each other and from each other's practice. And so there has been a lot.
lot of um, of applause given to the the richness of what has been occurring in the parking lot while we have been talking to you. So I think our conversation generated conversation, and the parking lot conversation clearly generated re, um, reflections on on our part because I mentioned that a few times this mm -hmm. afternoon. So it was um, it was an exchange that had meaning. I agree. Um, our webinars, sure, we generate a lot of discussion, and this is exactly the goal that we're attempting to achieve. It's really bringing people together across states and experiences and having these type of dialogue about important topics that affect us in the work we do in schools. So um, I'll just thank all of our audience members for your participation today. Um, and your enthusiasm for this work. Um, it's really wonderful to see. So we're going to move those um, two polls off. And <clears throat> at this point, the presentation is finished for today. And I would like to open up for any outstanding questions. I know we were trying to address as many as we could as we went, but we will put up um, One other poll, um, and if you have any additional questions that you would like Sandra and Penelope to respond to, we can take care of that now. I guess it's a good sign that there's no real outstanding questions, that our presenters did a wonderful job of uh, covering the topic thoroughly throughout the session. Well, it certainly we have one that just came in. Um, Pat's asking about some appropriate icebreaker questions, so maybe some ways to get this conversation started um, with educators. I'm sorry, what, what are some appropriate icebreaker questions? Is, is that? Um, yeah, I think maybe Pat's asking about some suggestions or strategies for opening up this conversation with educators. OK, so I, I think that um, a very strong overarching one is, is again, to have um, colleagues talk about um, what, what were their aspirations when they came into the, um, the career path of education? Um, and um, then moving on to say, and, you, and how, has that, um, ha, how has that changed, and how have you had to adjust you know, your approach? What are some of the commonalities of learners of today and learners 10 years ago and so forth. Now, I have seen this done beautifully by sorting um, the a faculty group um, into timelines. So those who are teaching for the first to fifth year, those who have been teaching for 15 years, more than 15, and you raise the same questions and then listen to each other's um, responses not only a great icebreaker, it's a great team builder for faculty, um, you know, who have a range of, of experiences. Wonderful. Now folks are, are yeah. getting their questions in. So we'll try to touch on as many of these as possible. Um, one that John Spence is asking is related to the work at the SEA level, and I think this is one that is really interesting because he's asking what steps, if any, do you see SEAs taking to address this topic and what policy implications might exist? Um, are you seeing that this topic touching at the state level? And I know you worked at the state level, Penelope, so um, well, I think how something beautiful that came across, which is a, 
um, uh, grant opportunities for districts to, um, to get some funding if they would work on um, their disproportionality um, uh, challenges. And uh, that's another way to, to back into taking a look at your demographic shifts and knowing who's today's learners. So I, I think um, when the, the state education agencies that are um, giving incentives for people to be curious about their, their, um, their demographics and how they're adjusting, that's very um, encouraging. And we'll kind of capture one of the last kind of themes that I see in the questions around pre-service teachers and how to really, um, we talked about it a little bit, but how can we um, really get this conversation going with our pre-service teachers? What kinds of activities and resources might be used to help open their understanding of cultural competence and culturally responsive teaching? Again, Penelope, I've I've been invited by a number of faculty members here at Rutgers Graduate School of Education to, um, to have conversations with um, the first uh, year teachers who are aspiring teachers. And one of the things that, that I do is, is to have them um, uh, think about the implications of being a teacher in the same community over a long period of time. And I talk about um, the adjustments that have to, that teachers are um, called upon to make. And I use some prominent communities, and I'm going to name one in New Jersey because people know this community because of the university, and that's Princeton. And for a long time, Princeton was a very lily white, high, high economic um, a community, and still is, uh, many of us would quite challenged to drive by a home there. But there's a corridor of Princeton that started to emerge while I was uh, uh, assistant commissioner in the State Department with a, um, an in, a major influx of Mexican um, families who became, um, and, and those families were recruited by Princeton University um, to do you know, some entry level employment. Um, the, the movement of the families into the community, albeit on the extremities of the community, was the first time that the school system was significantly challenged in terms of number and, and diversity um, uh, and required them to, to do everything that we're talking about today to have the courageous conversations, to take a look at, at um, their standards, their clear communication. For the first time, they had to form um, English language classes and also to start to um, disseminate communication um, to families in dual language. So um, I think that might some insight to the, the importance of in um, preparing teachers to enter to the profession. We need to talk authentically about the fact that don't select a community or, or aspire to be in a particular community because you think you're going to be able to avoid <laughs> the challenge of diversity or cultural um, you know, cultural challenges in your delivery of instruction. If, if, if your mindset is that you want to be in a safe place and all you want to be able to do is to teach content, then I think we need to invite you out of the profession. Well, with that, we're going to wrap up today. Uh, I know folks are giving their praise in the parking lot, but I want to take this moment to um, ask folks to give a virtual round of applause for Dr. Tomlinson Clark and Dr. Latimer for the wonderful presentation today. Um, I know the conversation was rich and really nicely delivered um, by both of you. So thank you for, for leading us in this conversation today.
Thank you. Thank you. Quite for the opportunity. And I will go through a few housekeeping pieces and get everyone right out of here on time. If you have questions about um, the topic, you can certainly reach out to either Sandra or Penelope. You see their email addresses there. If you have questions about the work that the Realm Mid Atlantic is doing or um, specific questions about this Educator Effectiveness webinar series, please reach out to me or to the Mid -Atlantic, um, Realm Mid Atlantic email. Um, you can continue this conversation on Twitter. We are on Twitter at Realm Mid Atlantic or on Facebook. Um, we do encourage you to keep coming to our sessions, keep learning. Our next session will be in August. We'll take a little break for the summer and um, get back in here to talk about engaging families in partnerships to promote student success. And I think it's a nice follow-up to this conversation, um, really looking at ways we can um, promote family engagement in our schools. Um, and we'll have Dr. Joyce Epstein from Johns Hopkins to lead us in that conversation. As we mentioned, I think at the beginning, the survey is really important to us. We want to respond to your needs and make sure that we're touching on the areas that are important to you. So we hope you'll take a few minutes to fill out our evaluation um, before you go today. And that really helps us plan for our future sessions. And at this time, we're going to wrap up for today. Again, thank you all for participating. And we look forward to seeing you again at one of our future webinars. <laughs>